Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Bree Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes. But also, our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show and YouTube, where we have special behind the narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic author to write their novels and what was going on in the world at the time, check out the Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we'll be continuing Anne's House of Dreams by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 5. The Homecoming. Dr. David Blythe had sent his horse and buggy to meet them, and the urchin who had brought it slipped away with a sympathetic grin, leaving them to the delight of driving alone to their new home through the radiant evening. Anne never forgot the loveliness of the view that broke upon them when they had driven over the hill behind the village. Her new home could not yet be seen, but before her lay Four Winds Harbor like a great shining mirror of rose and silver— Far down she saw its entrance between the bar of sand dunes on one side and a steep, high, grim red sandstone cliff on the other. Beyond the bar, the sea, calm and austere, dreamed in the afterlight. The little fishing village, nestled in the cove where the sand dunes met the harbor shore, looked like a great opal in the haze. The sky over them was like a jeweled cup from which the dusk was pouring, the air was crisp with the compelling tang of the sea, and the whole landscape was infused with the subtleties of a sea evening. A few dim sails drifted along the darkening fur-clad harbor shores. A bell was ringing from the tower of a little white church on the far side, mellowly and dreamily sweet. The chime floated across the water, blent with the moan of the sea. The great revolving light on the cliff at the channel flashed warm and golden against the clear northern sky, a trembling, quivering star of good hope. Far out along the horizon was the crinkled gray ribbon of a passing steamer's smoke. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, murmured Anne. I shall love Four Winds, Gilbert. Where is our house? We can't see it yet. The belt of birch running up from that little cove hides it. It's about two miles from Glen St. Mary, and there's another mile between it and the lighthouse. We won't have many neighbors, Anne. There's only one house near us, and I don't know who lives in it. Shall you be lonely when I'm away? Not with that light and that loveliness for company. Who lives in that house, Gilbert? I don't know. It doesn't look... exactly as if the occupants would be kindred spirits, Anne does it? The house was a large, substantial affair, painted such a vivid green that the landscape seemed quite faded by contrast. There was an orchard behind it, and a nicely kept lawn before it, but somehow there was a certain barrenness about it. Perhaps its neatness was responsible for this. The whole establishment, house, barns, orchard, garden, lawn, and lane was so starkly neat— it doesn't seem probable that anyone with that taste in paint could be very kindred, acknowledged Anne. Unless it were an accident, like our blue hall. I feel certain there are no children there, at least. It's even neater than the old cop place on the Tory Road, and I never expected to see anything neater than that. They had not met anybody on the moist red road that wound along the harbor shore. But just before they came to the belt of birch which hid their home... Anne saw a girl who was driving a flock of snow-white geese along the crest of a velvety green hill on the right. Great scattered firs grew along it. Between their trunks, one saw glimpses of yellow harvest fields, gleams of golden sand hills, and bits of blue sea. The girl was tall and wore a dress of pale blue print. She walked with a certain springiness of step and erectness of bearing— she and her geese came out of the gate at the foot of the hill as Anne and Gilbert passed. She stood with her hand on the fastening of the gate and looked steadily at them, with an expression that hardly attained to interest, but did not descend to curiosity. 
it seemed to Anne, for a fleeting moment, that there was even a veiled hint of hostility in it. But it was the girl's beauty which made Anne give a little gasp, a beauty so marked that it must have attracted attention anywhere. She was hatless, but heavy braids of burnished hair, the hue of ripe wheat, were twisted about her head like a coronet. Her eyes were blue and star-like. Her figure in its plain print gown was magnificent, and her lips were as crimson as the bunch of blood-red poppies she wore at her belt. Gilbert, who is the girl we've just passed? asked Anne in a low voice. I didn't notice any girl, said Gilbert, who had eyes only for his bride. She was standing by that gate. No, don't look back. She's still watching us. I never saw such a beautiful face. I don't remember seeing any very handsome girls while I was here. There are some pretty girls up at the Glen, but I hardly think they could be called beautiful. This girl is. You can't have seen her or you would remember her. Nobody could forget her. I never saw such a face except in pictures. And her hair. It made me think of Browning's Court of Gold and Gorgeous Snake. Probably she's some visitor in Four Winds. Likely someone from that big summer hotel over the harbor. She wore a white apron and she was driving geese. She might do that for amusement. Look, Anne, there's our house. Anne looked and forgot for a time the girl with the splendid, resentful eyes. The first glimpse of her new home was a delight to eye and spirit. It looked so like a big, creamy seashell stranded on the harbor shore. The rows of tall Lombardy poplars down its lane stood out in stately purple silhouette against the sky. Behind it, sheltering its garden from the too keen breath of sea winds, was a cloudy fir wood, in which the winds might make all kinds of weird and haunting music. Like all woods, it seemed to be holding and enfolding secrets in its recesses, secrets whose charm is only to be won by entering in and patiently seeking— Outwardly, dark green arms keep them inviolate from curious or indifferent eyes. The night winds were beginning their wild dances beyond the bar, and the fishing hamlet across the harbor was gemmed with lights as Anne and Gilbert drove up the poplar lane. The door of the little house opened, and a warm glow of firelight flickered out into the dusk. Gilbert lifted Anne from the buggy and led her into the garden. Through the little gate between the ruddy-tipped firs, up the trim red path to the sandstone step. Welcome home, he whispered, and hand in hand they stepped over the threshold of their house of dreams. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Bree Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Anne's House of Dreams. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. You can check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the rest of the links for our show.